Outlast is a horror stealth game that puts all its eggs in the imagination basket. It's got about as much focus on methodical sneaking as the Skyrim dungeon, but it's every bit as immersive as the best parts of one too. What I really love about Outlast as a horror game is that it lets you get close and personal with the residents of the asylum. And unlike most other what the hell was that creatures, the evil of Mount Massive is way more twisted once you get to know it. Red Barrel sidesteps the disappointment of Revelation by never really hiding what you're supposed to be afraid of, and it makes for an overall great survival horror. It is really hard to put the Stanley Parable down. I suspect this is going to be the game I'll show off to company more than anything else on this list. Stanley came to a set of two open doors. He entered the door on his left. It's clever and funny, it's smart and satirical, but it's also bite-sized and brimming with discovery. The Stanley Parable was all too willing to surprise me, and having played the mod that came before it, I was pretty sure I knew what to expect. I didn't, you don't, go play it. I don't know how to convince you of this, but I really do want to help you to show you. Experiencing the antechamber for the first time is like being dropped straight through the looking glass into Wonderland. It is a riddle wrapped in an enigma wrapped in a video game, and I wouldn't want to spoil too much about how it plays out, but the first time you turn around and you aren't where you thought you were is incredibly exciting. The game is riddled with literal writing on the wall, which is constantly handing out metaphorical life advice that's only vaguely relevant to your actions in the game. And this pseudo-narration really brings the world to life by convoluting your every move. The whole game's about touching and experimenting with your unstable surroundings, and it's really satisfying to take part. <coughs> Nino Kuni is a love letter to the JRPG. <coughs> oh, what's what's that? You you can't take me seriously anymore. Oh, okay. That's that's fine. Um yeah, okay. But it is! It really, truly is! Nino Kuni almost perfectly encapsulates my childhood memories of playing a story-based game for the first time. So much of the game's art and design feels tailor-made to reminisce about Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy and what you remember Pokémon being. Walking around that world map, basking in Joe Hisashi's phenomenal soundtrack really hit the mark for me. I have no qualms saying it's the best JRPG of the generation, and really the best I've played in the genre since Dragon Quest VIII. The only really big disappointments for me were the stingy use of Studio Ghibli's hand-drawn cutscenes and the minimum of voice acting that went into the English localization. I had a great time playing this. First down? First down, that's right. Man, that's confusing. It's a strange little piece of praise, but <laughs> The Last of Us is the most recommendable oh, game of 2013. Too. And in another way, it's a poster child for the type of games that were so popular this generation. The story is a cut above the typical action romp, the gameplay is solid if not long in the tooth, Who's there? and its production is sky high. What my issue was while playing it was I couldn't shake the feeling that the gameplay was irrelevant to the game's most interesting sections, but that did not stop me from enjoying the heck out of it. Oh, and if you've already finished the game, make a point of seeing its alternate ending. You will not be disappointed. Well, what can I say? I love Super Mario. Just like the 3DS game in 2011, Super Mario 3D World had me worried. It starts off a little bit too easy, and it doesn't have the visual excess of Mario Galaxy, but the game is just so chocked full of pure, unadulterated joy, it's it's just damn hard not to love it. I'm still not a fan of having more than two people on the screen at once, but playing with the people close to me delivered the exact kind of deja vu you'd hope a Nintendo game would. It's an instant Nintendo classic. Holy smokes, I never thought this would end up being a controversial pick, because Bioshock Infinite is incredible. Let's be fair, just like everybody else, I have a near laundry list of complaints to go along with its many accolades, but it's the sort of passion and nitpickiness that stems from something so clearly worth obsessing over. Plain and simple, I wish that video games did not feature killing so prominently. But I can't sit here and pretend that mowing down thousands of guards in Bioshock Infinite detracted from how riveted I was to explore the city of Columbia. The game has high highs and low lows, but what I love here is cut from the cloth of my favorite stuff in games. I find it really difficult to describe why these types of stories appeal to me, because I understand so readily why someone wouldn't like them at all. If you don't have the patience to watch 20 minutes of monkeys at the start of 2001, or roll your eyes at any point during Mulholland Drive, you're not going to find a single thing to love along Route Zero. But if you're like me, and you're afraid to blink when you're watching those things, 
then let me present you with your new favorite game, Kentucky Route Zero. This is by far the most striking game of the year, and it's probably the most unlike anything else on this list. The real triumph in this game is its ability to wrap a story around your choices and not impose choices on a narrative. It's super duper great. And then there's Saints Row 4. This is the game that's screaming play me, play me from a pile of games that look just like it. And come hell or high water, it is going to leave you satisfied. It's a video game that's here to make sure you're having fun, and if it catches you glancing at your phone, it's liable to scream, drop its pants, and start dancing around for your own amusement. There's not another game this year that had me bursting out laughing alone through its gameplay. Aw, oh, you need to escape a giant death facility. How about you try it to What is Love? What is love? Aw, oh, is this building bothering you? Don't even worry about it, we're gonna jump right on over that thing. Oh, you're looking for love, huh? Don't you worry, your pretty little head, because your entire party is down to clan with the President of the United States of America because this is Saints Row, damn it, and we're gonna have a goddamn good time. Nice work, Olake. I think that Gone Home is the kind of game that proves what we're doing here is worthwhile. Hi, Mom. Uh, so I got my ticket home from Europe. I get back on June 6th, but it's a really late flight because that was the cheapest, so it gets in at midnight. But don't worry, I'll get a shuttle from the airport so you don't have to pick me up. It's a grown-up game. It's the kind of entertainment that uses our medium to make something worth passing on. Bye. It's a game, make no mistake. It is a video game. You play with it. But it's so much more than another tired example of how games are art. It's an encapsulation of a distinct culture in time. It marries game to cinematic storytelling, and it does it without using a cutscene. You know that feeling where the first moment you see someone, it's like they have a big gold star around them? It's a realization of how much more this medium is capable of. And if you don't get around to playing it, expect to be surprised when your kids are learning about it in school. From Super Metroid to Gone Home, Environmental Storytelling 101. It's my game of the year. She's always drawing in this notebook. Looking so intense. I had no idea how I would ever, like, have an excuse to talk to her. Till I noticed she and her friends hang out and play Street Fighter at the 7-Eleven every day after school. 